Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and New York City, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here are the hosts of your show, Buck Sexton and Porter Stansberry. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing research service published by Stansberry Research. And we've got a few things to talk about this week. Uh, this year, I should say. Happy New Year. It's it's January 2019 already. Man, what happened to 2018? So, look, the first thing on everybody's mind, you know, every investor's mind, okay, at the beginning of a year is what's the stock market going to do this year? So, I, I can't not talk about that. There's no way I can not talk about that. Thing is, if you've been listening to podcasts that I've been doing here for several weeks already, you know that I really don't like to make predictions. I don't like to say the market is going to fall 22% in 2019 or over any other period of time. However, like if you're an if you're an equity investor, you can't not think about the future. And I think the best way to think about the future is just to ask where do we stand right now? And that may be a familiar question to you if you've read Extreme Value or anything else that I've written about this topic, um, because that that's um, it's a phrase often used by a guy named Howard Marks, who wrote a book called uh, The Most Important Thing that I recommend all the time. I think it's a great book. It's a quick read, and it's deeply insightful. I highly recommend it. And Howard says, hey, don't make predictions. Just ask, where do we stand? And I think that's a brilliant distinction to make. So no prediction. I'm just going to say, tell you where we stand, and you know, if if history, which tends to rhyme, not repeat, you know, it doesn't repeat verbatim, it rhymes. If history rhymes, then I'll tell you where I think we're probably headed in the next couple of years here. So where are we right now? Well, the S and P 500 is right around 2,500. Okay, that's about I think it's about 14 to 15 percent below its all time peak in in September of 2018, uh, just above twenty nine hundred. So, you know, look, we're, that's that was the most expensive moment in the history of the stock market in the United States, including the very top of the dot com bubble in, in early 2000 and the very top of the market in 1929. Right, those were the two big, most expensive moments, and and September of 2019, from late August really through September 2019, the market was more expensive than that. So the question is, that's that's we stand 14 percent below that. So if you you know if you're gonna go, uh, we're gonna talk about cars later on in the program with our special guest today. So I'll stick with that theme. I'll start, I'll get, start off with that theme. If you walk onto a car lot and you and the guy says, you know, this is the highest price this thing has ever sold for, but for you, I'll take fourteen percent off. It's like, eh, fourteen percent. I mean, I'll take it, but eh, it's just not a whole lot. Um, and and from the most expensive thing, you know, just think of the most expensive thing you've ever bought, the most expensive house or diamond or anything, and then you take fifteen percent off. And does it really mean anything to you? So that's where stocks are right now. And moving forward, you know, whenever we've been like this in the past, the the reasonable expectation, if history rhymes, you know, over the next usually about two years or or less, you know, we had the episode in uh, from 1973 to 74, um, you know, just within my lifetime, uh, and we had. Uh, you know, there was a, a top from uh, like 80 to 82. And, you know, of course, 2000 to 2002, from October 2007, March 2009, you, you, you get the picture. You know, generally speaking, very roughly speaking, once you get one of these massive tops within two years, you see a big, fat, hairy bottom that from these levels, normal would be about minus 50, 60 percent. 
So, you know, from 2,900, what's that? It's, you know, somewhere just above 1,000, 1,100 or so on the S&P 500, and we're at 2,500. So, you know, there's a lot of downside left if history rhymes. Thing is, of course, history doesn't have to rhyme. But that's the reasonable expectation, okay? Not great news <laughs> for stocks in 2019. But, I, you know, again, if I find a good long, uh, if I find a really attractive situation, I'm going to recommend buying it because that's what you have to do. Because I'm always going to – I'm a value investor, so I'm always going to look for stuff that's, that tends to be cheap no matter what the overall market is doing. Okay? So that is where we are and that is what I think you can expect. And, you know, just looking elsewhere in the news today, um, you know, you can see some of the kind of, you can see some of the degradation um, that, that's already begun. Uh, General Electric, a favorite topic, you might, you might even call it a whipping boy <laughs> of us at Stansberry, um, lost 23 billion bucks last quarter. Uh, fourth biggest decline in the S&P, in the Standard & Poor's 500 index in 2018. Only three stocks did worse. And the thing that I've been watching, uh, it, you, may, you may recall from previous podcasts, it, are the bonds. And the GE bonds, when I first started looking at this, I thought, you know, the bond market isn't saying that this thing's going to, you know, really blow up too badly. And, and now it is. Because back then, Looking at if you just go on Bloomberg and grab, you know, there's like 450 or so bonds listed on Bloomberg. Uh, almost 200 of them are trading below 90 now. And back then it was very few. Uh, and there were none below. There was like one below 70. And now there's like a dozen or so. And, you know, there were very few below 70. And now there's like a few dozen. So it, it's it's definitely deteriorated. And when you get into the 60s and the 70s, like par is 100. You know, that's a healthy bond price, par or very near it, right? 98, 99, even 95. Anywhere in the 90s is a heck of a lot more healthy than the 60s and 70s and even 80s that we see um, now in, you know, almost 200 GE related bond issues. And those are asking prices on 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 Bloomberg. So, you know, it's deteriorating. It's ugly. Also ugly is, of course, you know, Sears has been Sears has been ugly for a long time. Look, it was, it was like six years ago um, when I said in extreme value, you don't want to you don't want to buy this thing because there was a big flaw in that company. Eddie Lampert, the CEO, was this well-known, successful value investor, and he thought he was going to run Sears similar to the way Warren Buffett ran Berkshire Hathaway. But Warren Buffett had insurance companies at the core of Berkshire Hathaway. And, you know, Sears is a retailer, and you just, you, you just can't do the same thing. You can't put a retailer like that at the core of this uh, of an investment operation. Of course, you know, somebody will say, hey, what about this company or that company? Maybe there's an exception. But I'm just saying it was a real bad idea. And and most of the time when somebody tries to do that, it's not going to work out that well. And of course, you know, Sears declared bankruptcy and and um, you know they weren't they weren't the only one uh, in 2018. Mattress firm uh, was owned by a, a South African company called Steinhoff, which I used as an example of of their bonds crashing, you know, they had a big scandal. Um, David's Bridal, Brookstone, there were there were plenty of of bankruptcies uh, in 2018. And of course, sort of on the upside, we saw breakouts in in the price of. Yeah, there was some good news. <laughs> yeah, there's some good news, folks. Okay, I got some good news, and the good news is um, gold, especially, is the one I. I kind of watch closer than silver. Silver um, has broken into the mid, you know, it was down around 14, I think, and, and has broken into the mid 15s. Gold was trying to punch up through $1,200 an ounce and is now uh, closer to 1300. Um, last time I looked, it was in the 1280s, like 1284, 1286, something like that uh, within the last 24 hours. So, 
that's real good. And, you know, if that uh, I fully expect that to continue um, happening. And, you know, I can't tell you on the podcast, but I think in extreme value, we have the number one best way, uh, best business to own uh, if you want to be long gold, because they own a lot. They, they, they take a little piece off the top of a huge cache of millions of ounces of gold that is sitting above the ground. So they don't have to dig it out of the ground. It's already above. So, you know, that's sort of, um, that's really where we stand. I think, I I think I just kind of, um, summed it up, right? The stock market is still unattractive. We've seen this deterioration in, uh, in a lot of other places, but I just kind of picked on GE and Sears because they're the big names that, that really, uh, crashed hard and, and had a really bad 2018. Um, the audio industry had a not so great 2018 Ford and GM are stopping production on a whole slew of vehicles. Um, so it, it's, it's been a rough 2018. Unfortunately, if history rhymes, I think we're going to have a rough 2019 as well. But you know, in the end, it's really healthy because the market can't be crazy, irrational, overvalued forever. And that, that's unhealthy, you know, because you can't go into the market and just buy something just because you think it's going to go up. There has to be rational investing happening. There has to be people doing fundamental analysis and investing in companies that they can hold for a long time. Can you imagine what the stock market would look like? If everybody was, if it was a constant casino all the time, it would be like, you know, 2018 up through September all the time, extraordinarily overvalued companies, crazy stuff, you know, that, that is just garbage businesses, Bitcoin and pot stocks and, you know, God knows what else, uh, you know, valued like it's going to go to the moon. You, you know, that would be that would be truly insane. There would be no investing possible in such an environment. So that's where we are. And it's time to get on to our guest. Um, and man, I love this guy. All right, everybody, it's time for our guest. I'm very excited about this today. Our guest is Mark Spiegel. Mark Spiegel is the managing member and portfolio manager of Stanfill Capital Partners and is a New York-based equity investor. Now, prior to founding Stanfill in 2011, he spent six years as an investment banker financing public companies. Prior to becoming an investment banker, Mark spent a year working for a micro-cap NASDAQ tech company, and he began his career with 17 years in the commercial real estate industry, where he experienced firsthand the opportunities and challenges faced by a wide array of client companies. And Mark tends to believe that all these experiences, banking public companies, working for a public company, securing real estate for a wide variety of companies, combine to provide the kind of real world experience that's extremely useful for an investor. And I would tend to agree quite a bit. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah. Um, you and I met very briefly after, uh, maybe you don't remember, there was a lot of people around after Whitney Tilson's short selling conference, not the last one, the, I think the one before that. And yep. uh, I, I was very excited to meet you and to, and to hear what you had to say. Um, just for our listeners' benefit, if you if you want to know about about Tesla, this is the guy to talk to, and that of course is mostly what we're going to talk about today. Until you get sick of hearing about it, I'll talk to you about Tesla. <laughs> Until you get sick of hearing about it, that's right. Uh, we we tend to talk uh, quite a bit about Tesla at Stansberry, um, and and I think we're we're pretty much on the same side as you are. Um, of course, Mark well, is. The- I mean, um, Tesla is maybe the most interesting stock that that I've ever seen, and and I hear this from guys who have been guys you've heard of who have been in this business, you know, for forty years, who are well known guys, because no one has ever seen a company that gets this much public scrutiny, you know, with this much market cap. Uh, you know, getting away with pulling off so much nonsense, you know, I mean, the kind of stuff 
this is the stuff you see on, you know, pink sheet Canadian mining companies or, you know, nano cap biotech press releases. And, you know, they've gotten away with it so far. They, of course, we all know how this ends because it always ends the same way. But that's why it's such a fascinating stock for so many people, especially the shorts. Yeah. And, and there are some folks on the long side who have kind of spoken out and, and are not, you know, idiots or anything. So it's, it's interesting. Well, that's your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I don't know them as well as you do. <laughs> but uh, so you, you actually alluded to, to a, someplace where I, I kind of wanted to start, um, which is, you know, how the heck, wh- wh- maybe start with what the worst of what you think they're getting away with, and then we'll talk about how the heck they're getting away with it. Well, okay. So, you, you know, in fairness, I mean, you know, I spend a lot of time or people short Tesla spend a lot of time, uh, talking about Musk's nonsense. I, I mean, the you know, the blatant 420 security fraud that he got away, you know, with a, a wrist slap for, and, and then he, you know, then he shoved the middle finger in the face of the SEC, right, by appointing an, quote, quote, independent chairperson that he literally said in an interview he controls and she does what he wants, and then, and then his, you know, his car racing, plane-owning, you know, massive CO2-emitting buddy, Larry Ellison, <laughs> you know, is the other new independent, uh, you know, board guy, right? And and you know, right. and and acknowledges to be a good pal. But really, that's that's a, that's sort of a distraction. It is a distraction. It's it's an amusing sideshow. I mean, the fact is, the auto industry is a horribly competitive, capital intensive business. Um, every major OEM is coming out with terrific electric cars. You know, starting you know, now and, and, you know, really accelerating over the next 24 months, they're actually a generation more advanced than Tesla's cars. They're far better built than Tesla's cars. And, you know, so it's really, you know, it's the competition that's going to put this company out of business. And that's been my thesis since I first got involved with it really in in size was, was over four years ago at this point. Um, and, and that's, what's going to do it in. And and the Musk stuff just is going to sort of accelerate. Well, it's a weird situation on on the one hand, normally Musk stuff would accelerate the demise, right? When you commit securities fraud and do this stuff he does. But on the other hand, you know, the fact that he's there is he's got these, this core group of true believers. And that's what, that's what sort of supported the share price. That's why it didn't collapse a long time ago. But, you know, with any charlatan out there, eventually the core group just kind of drifts away. You know, there's an old movie. I don't know how old you are. This is before my time, but I saw it, you know, on TV. It's called The Face in the Crowd with Andy Griffith when he's this preacher and he's got, you know, this massive following. And then they find out, you know, that he's that he's full of crap. And, and they just sort of gradually drift away when he's giving a talk and, and then it's over. And that's what's going to happen here. I mean, today the stock's getting slammed it's sort of maybe getting re-rated as a car company, not as some hyper growth, you know, fantasy stock. Tesla just announced this morning that they delivered a total of 90,700 vehicles in the final three months of 2018, which, you know, the analysts were expecting 92,000, so 1,300 short. And they're also lowering prices 2,000 on the Model S, X, and 3 to offset the cut in the federal tax credit for for electric vehicles. Yeah, and so the important takeaway there is there you know traditionally they've ended a quarter saying, well, we've got 8,000 more cars in transit that have been sold. Well, now they only have 1,000 of them. Um, you know, on the back of the envelope it looks as if they've got 7,000 or so uh unsold Model 3s uh sitting in inventory and and of course the the, the $2,000 price cut is meaningful um in two ways. It's first it's meaningful as you said it's offsetting that the, the loss, part, part of the loss of the, of the tax credit, which shows that there's a demand issue and they know it. But the other part is that's a huge impact on margin. You know, $2,000 a car is a big deal for a company that barely scraped out a, a, what I call a phony profit in Q3 and, and you know, and will scrape out another probably smaller phony crop profit for Q4. And then they're going to revert to massive losses in 2019. I have zero doubt about that. What's phony about the profit, Mark? Well, th- th- multiple things. For one thing, uh, by the way, when I say phony, I don't mean they literally, you know, made up the number, but Got they it. grossly yeah. overspent on on SG&A 
and R&D, which are the things they need to do to, to keep the car company going. Uh, a massive amount of it were from um, uh, ZEV credits from California, uh, price of which is steadily going down as more people have electric cars. And even more than that, what are called uh, GHG credits, which is a federal credit you can sell, but you can only sell that on cars sold in the U.S. And now the Model 3 um, you know, sales are going to shift over to Europe until they go through that backlog and, and Asia. So that number is, is going way down. Um, and they just, you know, they just underspent in a lot of ways that, that were not a sustainable way even to maintain the company's current size, much less to grow the company. So um, that's why. Oh, and, and then not part of not part of phoniness, but Model S and X sales, which are their, by far their highest margin cars. Those are going to absolutely collapse this year as, as other luxury competitors come in. They're already getting slammed in Europe by the Jaguar I-Pace, the Audi e-tron. Uh, debuts in Europe actually literally this week. Mercedes has its first all-electric um, SUV mid-year, and then of course the Porsche Taycan at the end of the year. So th- that's going to deduct, you know, another I don't know, a couple hundred million dollars a quarter from profitability. Um, oh, and then okay, so this actually is phony, and I consider it fraudulent. They grossly under-reserved for warranties on these cars. They're spending far more on warranty repair work for these cars then they reserve. And and the way that works is you set a reserve, which actually comes out of the gross margin of the car. If you reserve about 2,200 a car, which is roughly what they did, and over the lifetime of a car, it's more as if they're spending, you know, $4,500. Well, that's another $2,000 or so per car in false profit that they reported in Q3. So you add it all up, you know, these guys are going to lose uh, hundreds of millions per quarter in this coming year, the year where we just began, 2019, and maybe over a billion, you know, because of all the lawsuit liability they have from that 420 tweet. And, you know, being, there's over 400 lawsuits against this company, all kinds of stuff, lemon law, labor stuff, you know, unfair practices. There's a guy who's compiled a site of them. It's unbelievable. I mean, this, this could be the most sued company of any size anywhere, you know, in the world. It's just amazing. You know, other than maybe class act, you know, Johnson and Johnson or whatever has all these baby powder lawsuits. So uh, last quarter is the best quarter you'll ever see from these guys in terms of profitability. Right. And to be fair, it was the, the 90,700 vehicles um, that were delivered. That, that's a record, right? That's that's the, the most they ever delivered. Uh, it was uh, just correct. The, it is a record. And, and we can't even come. We can't even figure out how they got to that number when we measure the amount of activity and guys trying to monitor production at the factory. So, you know, if that's a real number, it's, it's not a particularly good number. It's not a hyper growth number. And maybe one day we'll find out how accurate those numbers actually were. Uh, you, you have got me on the edge of my seat. What, what do you have like spies at the factory? How do you do now, this? Well, a- anecdotally, you know, anecdotally, and you can find this stuff, you know, on Twitter, there's a great, none of us know each other. Some of us have met each other subsequently who came to the same conclusion about this company all around the country, actually all around the world. And, you know, we monitor lots, you know, all around the place and guys will go out. Guys went out over this past weekend and took photographs and said, oh yeah, there's 80 model threes in inventory here. There's 60 here. They tried to hide a hundred of them on this lot around the corner. They're hoping nobody will see. So we knew about all this inventory. It wasn't a secret. It was, you know, it was all over Twitter. But the other thing, you know, noticed was a lot less activity at, at the at their delivery centers uh, in December than there was in that big month they had in September when they had all the volunteers and the army of people and people, you know. And so it strains credibility that they delivered that many more cars this quarter than they did last quarter, unless there was some kind of a fleet sale, which is possible. They supposedly did a fleet sale to Enterprise. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Listen, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, you know, if if the numbers are inaccurate, you know, that's just a bonus if you're short the stock. The bottom line is it's an egregiously overvalued car company. I mean, you know, this is, this is a company now that, that has, I don't know about today, but as of last week, had, had the market cap. You know, larger than GM, larger than Ford. I mean, GM sells nine million. I think it's nine million cars a year or something like that. And 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 Tesla's on a run rate of of three hundred and fifty thousand cars a year. You know, I mean, these guys have Tesla has a again. I, I haven't checked this morning, but had had a larger market cap 
than Daimler and BMW. And those guys just mint money, right? And by the mm-hmm. way, they're both coming out with all kinds of electric cars and they know how to build them. So, you know, this is just, this is going to be a stock for the history books. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. Yeah. So today, just to kind of update to the minute here, I've got uh, 47 billion market cap for GM versus 53 billion for Tesla. So it's insane. So do you, do you think this is a zero, Mark? Well, yeah, correct. And, 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 so it's actually even more expensive because you, you will see a higher enterprise value, for instance, for like for the for the larger OEMs. But that's almost all due to their financing arms, you know, um, their mm-hmm. leasing arms. So if you exclude that, you know, those guys have net cash and, you know, Tesla has this massive amount of, of net debt. So it's it's ridiculous. By the way, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, wow, well, there's smart people along Tesla. I mean, if you see any of these people interviewed. They don't have any specifics. They they couldn't tell you really anything about this company. All they say is, well, Elon is great. Elon will figure it out. You know, I mean, Larry Ellison, you know, who should know better after getting taken in Theranos. Larry Ellison says, who are you to criticize? And he literally said this. I'm paraphrasing. Who are you to criticize Elon Musk? He lands rockets on barges, right? Now, you know, putting aside that that has nothing to do with the car business, people have known how to land rockets on barges for 40 years, right? If, if that were a <laughs> profitable business, don't you think, you know, Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Grumman would be landing rockets on barges? It turns out it's not a profitable business. It's cheaper to actually use disposable rockets, right? And of course, all these years, Musk and SpaceX were claiming SpaceX was profitable. Then it turns out it's not profitable. The Wall Street Journal ran the story. I mean, Musk is a pathological liar is basically what it is. And I have no hesitation in saying that because I can cite instance after instance of his pathological lying and why people who should know better invest in this guy is just beyond me. They must be thinking, well, Elon may be a liar, but he's our liar. He's lying on our behalf. Well, guess what, guys? You know, (laughs) if if a guy's going to lie on your behalf, he's also going to lie against your behalf. The only behalf that a pathological liar lies on is his own behalf, right? So it's it's an amazing stock. It's it's incredible to me that you know that guys running billions of dollars would be long this thing. You know. Yeah. So getting back to the the question I asked before, how are they getting away with it? It sounds like you know it's like news flow and you know this sort of constituency of of uh, you know shall we call them ultra naive long longs. Uh, you know, owning and buying the stock is is maybe the answer. Is that right? Yeah. Well, look, you have small people who really are just dummies, like this woman uh, Kathy Wood from Ark, who has her four thousand dollar price target and says Tesla is leading everybody on on um, um, on um, uh, what do you call it on autonomous driving, which is completely absurd. If you speak <laughs> to any expert in the industry. They'll tell you Tesla is a joke. First of all, you can't do it without LIDAR. And and second, their cars, you know, cross lines and crash all the time. Tesla is just more reckless in putting probably the worst major OEM product actually on the road. Other guys are smart enough not to put it on the road. There's not reckless, you know, the way Musk is. So, but then you've got guys who are running real money, you know, like this guy at Bailey Gifford or T. Rowe Price. And you see them interviewed. They don't have any specifics at all. And, and I guess, I guess. One thing I think will get them to finally throw in the towel, a few things. One one thing is news such as the news that broke today, which is, guess what, guys? This isn't a hypergrowth story anymore. But the other thing is, and look, I've never met this Bailey Gifford guy, so I don't know if he belongs to a, a country club, but I'm speaking metaphorically here. You know, the okay. guy pulls up to his country club one Sunday morning in his Tesla, if he has one, and he sees everyone else is driving much cooler I-Paces and E-Trons and Tacons. And he says, holy shit, these guys at Tesla don't have any special sauce. And, you know, what I own is Palm Pilot and, and the iPhone and the BlackBerry just came out, you know, or the very own BlackBerry and the iPhone just came out, you know. So, right. you know, they'll wake up. You know, I mean, to me, this has been obvious. That's why I've been short this for four years, because all these great EVs coming out now, the OEMs have been talking about them for the last three or four years, because it's a five-year cycle to develop a new car, right? So I've known about this, and I thought wrongly, of course, in hindsight, I thought, oh, well, this is obvious. You know, in four or five years, this car is, you know, Tesla's priced for perfection for 10 or 15 years from now, but in four or five years, 
You're going to get swamped with better cars. Everybody will see this, and the stock will stop going up, and it'll work its way down, and that'll be the end of it. Well, apparently nobody cared, right? But now the now those cars are staring them right in the face, and they're like, oh, what do I own here when Porsche is making a better EV than Tesla, and it's you know only a you know three thousand dollars more? You know that's what's that's what's going to go on in 2019. 2019 is the is the demise of this of this nonsensical bubble stock. You know, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think 2019 is going to be the demise of a lot of stocks. Um, but uh, so you've been short the thing for four years. And four years ago, it was like it it, it had a one on the front of it. Uh, and now yeah, it's got so a th- been, now it's over so, 300. Right. So I first got short Tesla in a tiny position, like a, really a meaningless position in like the high 90s in like 2013. And I and then I got short Tesla really in size when it broke through 250, uh, whenever that was. I think it first broke through 250. I'd have to pull up a chart. I don't have it in front of me. You know, maybe in 2014 at some point. That, that's when I got short in size. And I've maintained a sizable position since then. Now, what's, what's cost me a lot of money, I mean, if you look as we're talking the stock is a tad over three hundred dollars, and that's actually not that much more than two fifty over four years, right? And way underperformed the Nasdaq or whatever. But what killed me on this stock, and what cost me a lot of money, is the whipsawing. And this is why I don't recommend that anybody ever short a stock. <laughs> Let me just say that up front. <laughs> this is—I mean, I know you probably have a disclaimer. This is not advice, blah blah blah. My advice is, you know, unless you're unless you're insane, the way most short sellers are. Just don't short stocks. Just say, you know what, that stock is a joke. I'm just going to avoid that stock. You know, you'll, you'll, chances are you'll be a lot happier and a lot better off. But what happens when you short a stock, you know, let's say you want to make this some percentage of AUM. Let's say you want to make a stock, you know, 10% of your, of your portfolio and you shorted it at 250. Well, if it goes to 300, you got to cover some of that stock, right? And then if it goes back to 250, you know, then you put it back on to get it back up to 10%. And then it goes to 350. And then you have to cover it all the way up. And then it comes back down to, you know, to 290. And then you put it back on. It's the whipsawing, you know, that, that, that will kill you in a short position until it finally collapses on you. And that whipsawing has cost me a lot of money. But if, if you're going to be short meaning, in meaningful size at the beginning, there's really no way around that, you know, unless you're willing to be short, meaningful size, and then find yourself short, you know, twice meaningful size, right? Because you don't cover any. If I didn't cover any on this thing, it would be a relatively minor loss for my portfolio. As it turned out, it cost us a lot of money. I mean, I think we'll make it all back on the way down, but it, it's it's certainly been frustrating. So, Mark, when you're covering, are, are you... Um you know, is a broker telling you you have to, or is it just basic portfolio oh, no. management? You know, no, this is me as a portfolio manager. We've never had any kind of a margin call. I mean, we we don't use margin in the fund. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I guess we use margin because you know we've got a bunch of shorts that that tend to offset the longs. But in terms of net, I mean, we've it's never been a liquidity issue. It's been a hey. You know, this is, I mean, I've averaged this. I mean, first of all, just to back up, I run a very concentrated portfolio, okay? So mm-hmm. my average number of positions is 10, and I've had any, I've had as few as three and as many as 15. So, you know, my typical position size might be 10%. I've, I've averaged probably around a 20% position size for Tesla. So, you know, that said, I, you know, but if the thing doubles or, or goes up two and a half X, I don't want to wind up with a 60% position size. So that's that kind of whipsawing is what has killed us. That's that's why I just, you know, and you could say, well, you, you know, you should just buy puts, which is true. But, you know, the, the, the premiums on puts has been super expensive. In fact, one of the best things we did, you know, so that's so far anyway, you know, we've sold hugely out of the money Tesla calls and collected like amazingly fat premiums on them, you know. Like I've sold, I, I've sold some some calls with us um, expire in, in January 2021, so two years from now, with with strikes in the high 600s and just collected massive premiums on them. But again, I'm not recommending anybody do that either because you know if the stock goes to a thousand, you can lose a lot of money that way. I think it's absurd that it could happen, but I can't tell you that it won't. So. Along with my, along with my <laughs> advice to never short stocks, I advise that you never sell 
uh, naked calls either. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, you're, um, so the, the, the call selling sounds like it helps you keep your, your outright short of the shares on. Well, it has lately. Yeah. For a while, you know, I hadn't done that for a while. And, and then actually one of my LPs who's a, a mathematically brilliant options trader who's in my fund because he would like some, some sort of old fashioned fundamental, you know, stock taking exposure. <laughs> he called me up one day and he said, you know what? He goes, I'm looking at these out of the money calls. He goes, in my entire life on the street, and this guy's a brilliant guy. He goes, I've never seen this kind of option premium. He goes, you might want to think of selling some of those. You know, he goes, I have. And, um, and he was right. And, and I did, I did sell some of them. So, um, but again, this is not advice. Do as I say, do not do as I do, please. If you're out there. Yeah. Don't try this at home, right? For professionals. Don't try this at home. Yeah. I try this in, in my home office, but uh, you know, yeah, I, I recommend you don't. I think that's great advice. I, I recommend the same thing to readers all the time. Uh, so Mark, we've got about, you know, five or 10 minutes here. Um, what, let, let's, let's not talk about, although there is one last question I do have about Tesla before I move on here. Um, do you think that Elon Musk smokes too much pot or not enough? I, I, <laughs> well, I don't think it's just pot. I mean, he's admitted, <laughs> I mean, he's admitted to doing LSD and, you know, there are a lot of rumors and, you know, people who know people, uh, you know, who say he does many other things, but I'm not saying that that's true. I mean, I am the first person to say I have no personal knowledge of that, but you know what, if he is, uh, NASA may get to the bottom of it because they did publicly say that they're doing a top to bottom uh, analysis of the culture at SpaceX. You know, it's one thing to, which Musk does to recklessly put 5,000 pound uh, unguided missiles out on public roads with this nonsense he calls autopilot. By the way, I, I don't know if you saw this on 60 Minutes. You know, on the one hand, Tesla says, oh, the driver must be attentive at all time. And if there's ever an autopilot crash, it's not our fault. You know, the, the driver effed up. And then he goes on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago and does a, hey, look, no hands on autopilot, right, on national TV. I mean, he, the guy is just so full of crap. But anyway, um, it's one thing to put these cars on the road and, oh, it's a crash and they die. But it's another thing to blow up astronauts. So, you know, NASA is very, very serious about, I think, about a no drug culture. And supposedly, according to the Wall Street Journal, they're doing a top to bottom investigation of the culture of SpaceX. And I wouldn't be surprised to see SpaceX, you know, lose a lot of government contracts going forward. Yeah, that makes sense to me, too. And I should also say, for the benefit of anyone who may ever listen to this, I have no knowledge of of. Elon Musk smoking anything. And I am simply referring to his crazy behavior. And if you've heard him on conference calls, for example, he just, there have been times when he just sounds like he's high or drunk or something. I mean, well, you certainly, you certainly have knowledge of him smoking and drinking. We don't know how much. I mean, he was on that podcast smoking dope or smoking pot. And he was on, and he put out a video of himself, you know, drinking hard booze on the roof of the Gigafactory once. So, uh, and, and he's admitted to taking LSD. So what we don't know is if, if there are any other powders he's ingesting. You know, all there are rumors of that. And, you know, we, we'd have to drug test him or, or speak to a dealer to get to the bottom of, of those rumors. So and, and of course, I, I couldn't care less what a guy. I mean, look, I'm a libertarian. I don't care what people do in their personal lives. I, I think drugs should be legal, frankly. And, you know, if you're going to do them, that's your problem. But, you know, you can't design uh, space capsules and and so-called uh, autopilot cars on public highways, uh, you know, under that influence, it could be very dangerous. I, I agree with you. I, I'm uh, on the subject of drugs. I am a full-on libertarian as well, and and I'm just talking about the craziness and and the fact, frankly, too, <laughs> that you know this guy is one of the most. He everything you know. The Longs think he's a genius, but. He's he strikes me as one of the most overcommitted people. He's got all these big projects going at once and he thinks he can do anything. And I think that's part of his problem. He's just kind of a megalomaniac. Well, you, yeah, you know, what's interesting on that genius thing. A guy wrote an excellent blog post about this the other day. And it's it's so true. People who don't know anything about a specific topic or industry here must pontificate on it and think he's a genius. 
But anybody who's actually an expert in that particular field will tell you, and it doesn't matter what the field is, that he has no idea what the F he's talking about. So he could get out there and talk about AI. And, and, you know, oh, he's so impressive. He knows all about AI. You talk to the experts in AI, they're like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. You know, he'll talk about his neural net to the brain connection. Oh, look what we do. He'll talk about tunnel boring. You know, talk to contracting companies that actually have been doing tunnel boring for years, right? And so he's just a charlatan, you know, and, and he's got this core group of people who fall for that crap. But you know what? As I said at the beginning of this conversation, they'll drift away over time and, and one day he'll find himself standing on a soapbox, you know, preaching to nobody. And, you know, then one day after that, he's going to probably find a pair of handcuffs slapped on him. And um, and we won't hear from him for a certain number of years, you know. Right. So the drifting away over time makes sense to me. But also tell me if this doesn't make sense to you, the, the kind of action you would see in this stock. It would be typical for this thing to just lose major, huge double digit percentages in a single day or even a single minute once the story kind of starts breaking down. Um, is that, well, I mean, that's, that, a yeah. that's a hundred percent true. And that's another reason, you know, a lot of people have said to me, Oh, well, you know, why don't you just, you know, shoot it in the back is the expression. You know, that's an expression. I picked that up from uh, Bill Fleckenstein. I think he, that's, I think he heard, I heard him say, you know, it's just, he wasn't talking specifically about Tesla. I don't think, but you know, he's like, I don't short strength, shoot it in the back. But the problem is, if you're not in it, you may not win it. I mean, this thing could gap down $150 one morning, right? And on the other side yeah. of the coin, so on the other side of the coin, I mean, this stock was, I don't know, it hit, it was in the high 200s in, in 2016, maybe higher. I'd have to pull up the chart. And it plunged to like the 140s, right? And then you say, well, okay, is it safe to short now? I'd be shooting it in the back. Well, guess what? It just rocketed back up from the 140s to the to the 370s over the next year and a half or whatever. So you just kind of have to have your position on and make it a position that you can sleep at night. You know, have, I mean, by the way, to backtrack, I'm not giving this advice to anybody. Nobody should be short this or anything. But my attitude has been, I have to have a position on, it has to be big enough to be meaningful, but not so big that it's going to put me out of business. And that's it, because what you just said is 100% right. I mean, you know, the DOJ is investigating Tesla, right? This is known, right? This is talked about. What happens if, you know, what happens if, they, if the FBI shows up and slaps a pair of cuffs on this guy one morning? This thing will gap down $200 like you could snap your fingers, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. It's uh, you just, you know, you, you kind of have to have the... Uh, the, the cojones to do a position like this and the experience and the willingness to, you know, to endure some pain. But if you can, you wake up one day and you're like, wow, what just happened? I just made a bunch of money. I mean, look, this, there's no question it's been painful, but the reason I've been able to endure the pain is I know this company so well. I've studied it so closely. I've studied the, the competitive environment and I just absolutely know I'm going to be right here, you know, eventually, you know. And look, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be right. I could be wrong, but I have an incredibly high level of conviction, but it's not blind conviction. I continually stay on top of what's going on out there in, in, in the EV market and, and with Tesla and with Musk. So it's just if you have a high level of conviction, I mean, look, I've made – most, in fact, I've made all my money being long, deep value micro cap stocks. I mean, Tesla is almost an anomaly in a way. And, and I mean, those things, I mean, I'll buy those things. The only time I can buy them in size is when, you know, a friend of mine calls it drinking from a fire hose, right? They're pretty illiquid. And the, and the only time you can buy them in size, you're sitting here, whoa, I'm the only buyer. Because if, talking about companies sometimes with a $30 million market cap, you know, what does everyone know that I don't know? And you just got to have conviction and you got to say, look, I've looked at this thing back inside and out and it's cheap and I don't know why they're selling, but I'm going to buy it. And if it gets cheaper and nothing changes, I'm going to buy more. I mean, if you don't have, this is just a general observation. If you don't have an incredible amount of conviction in your position, then it, you're going to get blown out of it. And because you will never, ever short something at the top and you will never, ever buy something at the exact bottom. Right. And and, you know, if you set yourself a stop at, you know, 8% or, or 10%, you know, below your cost, if it's a, if it's a long position, I've had plenty of companies go down 15 and 18%. 
And if you blow yourself out like that, you know, you're not going to own it. So I tell people it's really hard to just, to just trade on hunches or on even on charts or whatever. If, if you have a lot of conviction, I think that's, and, and you're right in your conviction. I think that's the way to, I think that's the way to make money in the market, you know, long-term as a fundamental investor, as opposed to, you know, a computer. Right. So you're talking about long-term years, many years of holding and the guy who would be stopping out a lot, you know, if he knows what he's doing is like a short-term trader. So they're, they're yeah, but, but I, mean, I, my, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah, my, my typical hold position on a long, you know, is anywhere from six months to four years. You know, I mean, I know where I'm going to sell that stock the day I buy it, you know, unless something changes with the company. So, you know, if I, I look at a company and say, you know, this is worth five bucks a share. You know, the, the, a lot of times the day I buy it at two dollars, I put in a, a good to cancel sell order you know, for at least some of it at $5, you know, I won't, I'll put it in for a small part at least just to alert me, Hey, it hit $5. So I'll get the update. Oh, you just sold some stock at $5. So, you know, if you don't know what something's worth the day you buy it, then how could you possibly know if you're paying a good price for it? You know, this is why, I mean, I look, there's exceptions to every rule. I've never owned Amazon. Okay. And it's impossible to come up with a fundamental justification for Amazon, but it's certainly been a tremendous stock. And look, I suppose there are some companies that you could say, look, I don't know what the hell this thing is worth, but I just know that one day it's going to be worth a hell of a lot more than I'm paying for it. Okay, fine. That's not my style. I have to say, this is worth 10 bucks a share. So, you know, I'm buying it at five, you know, and, and, and that's what I'm doing. You know, the, the, the day I buy it is the day I already have a sell price in mind. That sounds good to me, man. I'm a, I, some of the stuff you've said sounds like it's straight out of, uh, the intelligent investor, like even like chapter 20 of the intelligent investor, if I can be even that specific. And I, I totally agree, especially, you know, the last thing in chapter 20 is have the courage of your convictions. One of the last things. And um, yeah, it's funny. I, I never, I, I never read Graham. I, mean, I certainly read enough about Buffett and read some of his letters. So maybe, I, maybe it's been imparted that way, but yeah, like this, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. You know, I mean, no. it, 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 it is what it is, but you know, it's like, I, I you know, a lot of times people who don't do this, not even just professionally, but, you know, there are plenty of great, serious amateurs out there. I mean, I was a serious amateur before I ran money and, and they all get this. But, you know, a casual stock market, for a, a friend will casually say, hey, you know, I just bought some X, Y, Z today. Uh, uh, you know, I paid 20 bucks. I think it's a great price. I'm like, oh, OK, really? So what do you think it's worth? And they just give me this dumb look. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, listen, I'm like. I'm like, listen, you know, would you go out and buy a, you know, a new Mercedes uh, without looking, without knowing in advance what it's worth? Right. I mean, do you go into the car dealer and just say, hey, that's a pretty cool car. You know, um, I'll pay whatever you want for it. You know I mean? It's like, but people do this with stocks. They don't you you have to know what it's worth so that you know if you're paying a good price for it or not you know right right and we know you know they how, how people behave in the stock market it's crazy they're they're despondent at the bottom when everything's cheap and attractive and they're elated at the top when everything is priced for horrible returns and even losses and i think well, well that so that that ties exactly into the necessity of of doing enough work on the company to figure out what it's worth and then, and because that's your buying chance, right? When stocks are crashing, look, I'm not a, I don't, I don't buy relative value. I don't say, oh, well, you know, Netflix is, is 150 times earnings. So I'm going to buy this other streaming company for 110 times earnings because it's a bargain, <laughs> right? I mean, when it, when it collapses, they all collapse together. So I only buy absolute value. And, you know, look, the downside of that is it, it I don't know, it's probably been 18 months or something like that before I added a new name to my book because everything had gotten to my portfolio because everything had gotten so expensive. It turns out in sort of the crash or the, the big correction we had in December, I was able to add like four names to the book because I just sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. And, and, and Oh, this is cheap enough. And look, it's not easy pulling the trigger. You know, if the S and P is down, you know, 75 points and you're sitting there and you're the only bid on some micro cap company, which I was, but, you know, that's a that's your only chance to buy them. And B, that's where conviction comes in. If you did the work and you figured out what it's worth, at least you can say, all right, you know, maybe when I'm done buying, it'll drop another 18 percent. 
but at least I know it'll pass back up through this level and go a lot higher eventually because I did the work and that's what it's worth. I saw a great quote uh, from Stan Druckenmiller recently. Maybe it was an interview he did or something when he said he's, he's never, ever put on a large position without feeling sick to his stomach while doing it, you know, because, <laughs> because he's buying when the blood is running in the streets or, you know, he's shorting when, when, you know, the streets are pristine and the blood isn't yet running. Right. And, you know, if you're a contrarian investor, which is sort of a cliche, but I mean, I mean, what contrarian investor really means is, you, and, and this goes back to, I guess, Ben Graham, you're buying a stock, he would say a security that's mispriced, you know, or you're shorting one that's mispriced. I mean, if Tesla's selling for $350 and you say it's worth $5, then, you know, that's your opportunity, right? Or if some stock is selling for five and you figured out it's worth 20, well, you're, you're definitely a contrarian because you think the market is mispricing it. And the, I think the only way to make money, I, I shouldn't say this, I guess there are guys who make a lot more money than I ever made who are trend followers or whatever. Okay, fine. But, but if you're a fundamental investor, by definition, you have to be a contrarian. Otherwise, you can just buy the whole market and it'll go up at some pace over time when it's not correcting. That's okay, too. But individual stocks, by definition, you have to be a contrarian. Mark, I think that is, uh, we, we're, we're out of time. We've actually gone a little over and I'm happy to have done it. And I think that's an excellent place to leave off. I hope everybody listened very closely. Uh, and thanks so much for being here. I really, it, it's been a very exciting talk. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for having me on. It was, it was a lot of fun. And the last thing I'll say is if you're out there, don't, don't short stocks. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye-bye, Mark. Bye-bye. Take care. Wow. That was really exciting, as I knew it would be. Uh, Mark is just um, full of fantastic ideas and one of the most one of the most well-informed, one of the most deeply informed investors that I've ever come across, which I guess you have to be if you're running a concentrated portfolio of three to 15 names. Uh, that was great. So, hey, this concludes, uh, since we don't have a mailbag, uh, you guys aren't writing in, I guess you're taking off for the holidays. That's cool. But, uh, you know, if you want to email us with a question or a comment, just send it to feedback at investorhour.com. And, you know, we read them all and we try to respond to as many as possible, but uh, even the ones that hurt a little bit. Okay. So, uh, you know, write in and, and let us know what you're thinking. Okay. So that concludes another episode of Stansberry Investor Hour. Uh, be sure to check out our recently revamped website where you can listen to all of our episodes, see show transcripts. We get a lot of emails about that. And where you can enter your email to make sure that you get all the latest updates. So just go to the same address, www.investorhour.com. That's it for this week. Love us or hate us, just don't ignore us, folks. Thanks for listening, and I will see you all next week. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Porter and Buck? Send them an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansbury Investor Hour is produced by Stansbury Research and is copyrighted by the Stansbury Radio Network.